Um, so, which, which no science fiction author really, really successfully uh, foresaw. Um, so, so, is there a reason to, to believe that um, current science fiction is any more relevant or, or that science fiction is relevant as a tool for thinking about the future? And I think Uri also already said that it's not really about prediction, but about preparing ourselves for what the future might feel like and, and creating symbols and, and sort of imaginary artifacts from the future that actually inspire us to build them. And it's actually maybe worth saying a little bit more about um, how fiction itself works and, 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 and uh, why it helps science fiction to achieve these things I mentioned. Um, so fiction is very immersive, especially uh, reading. Um, so reading is about being inside somebody else's head or, or almost like wearing somebody else's skin and, and looking at uh, uh, a different world completely immersed in it. And there's actually neuroscientific evidence that shows that when we read uh, a book, um, when we read a fictional story, uh, not only do we imagine the things that are happening, but actually the same areas in our brains activate that would activate if, if we were to, to perform the actions that the text is describing. Uh, or if we read about imaginary characters, our brain makes no distinction between imaginary characters and people we know, know in real life. So, so fiction is enormously powerful in terms of creating very immersive simulations inside, inside our brains. And um, that sort of um, helps us to um, illustrate one possible application of science fiction, which is what, what is it like to feel uh, what, what does it feel like to, to interact with, with future objects and, and technologies? Uh, and how should we design them to make, make those, those interactions um, seamless and, and, and easy? Um, and there's actually uh, a growing trend to, to, to do that deliberately. So Brian David Johnson and Intel has, has a practice called uh, science fiction prototyping, where uh, they invite science fiction authors to, to write stories around uh, human problems emerging from the technologies that Intel is, is developing. Um, I mean, Utopia is also a visual, visual festival, so, so uh, online you can also find a lot of uh, videos around a concept called design fiction that, that show uh, people interacting with imaginary technologies. Um, uh, somebody who's written quite a lot about that is, is Bruce Sterling, whose, whose blog lists a lot of, lot of examples. But actually, my, uh, my favorite example of this kind of um, exploration of interaction through science fiction uh, comes from a book uh, uh, here called Make It So uh, by uh, designers Nathan Shedroff and Christopher Nessel, who go through a very wide range of um, uh, mainly science fiction films uh, and, and show different kinds of interfaces from, from all, those, all those movies. And then they actually uh, try to figure out what sort of interaction lessons can designers learn from those imaginary interfaces. And that they actually do a very clever job of even going all the way back to uh, The Voyage to the Moon, one of the very first science fiction uh, films by Georges Méliès, where um, basically, uh, obviously inspired by, uh, by uh, the book by Jules Verne, where uh, a, a cannon shell uh, is shot to the moon and, and sort of uh, delivers the first lunar visitors there. And uh, one of the things they, uh, that Shedroff uh, highlights in the book is um, that to us it sort of seems ridiculous that uh, they basically just push this door open and go and walk on the lunar surface. There's no airlock, there's, there's no, uh, there, there are no spacesuits or anything like that. There's no controls for the door, you just push it and it opens. And um, uh, they, in the book they actually turn it around and say, well, why shouldn't spaceship doors work like that? Um, what, if, what if you actually had a, a completely context-aware system controlling the spacecraft that would understand when it's safe to, to open the door and when it's simply safe to simply push on it and, uh, and, and open it. But, um, but these, are, these are sort of um, fra uh, fragmentary examples of, um, of how science fiction can uh, input into design. But there, there is a larger role that Uri also alluded to, which is world building. Um, and, and understanding uh, how new technologies actually interact um, with this whole web of social and human relationships. So, so not only what it's like to play with a new technology, but how it's going to impact society and our lives, what are the ethical implications, and so on. And that, that in science fiction is, is the practice of world building. To, to kind of allude to um, 
Frederick Paul's example that Uri showed, uh, Robert Heinlein takes that example further. So in order to, to build um, a good science fictional world, it's not enough to say that, yes, there are going to be motor cars. It's not enough that there are, there are going to be uh, highways covered in asphalt that stretch across continents or that there are going to be traffic jams. But um, in good science fictional world building, you should be able to say that, well, there's going to be an increase in teenage pregnancies because there are going to be drive-in movie theaters where teenagers can get away from their parents and, and have, have premarital sex. Um, so so that's, sort of, uh, that's the kind of deep speculation that you do find in the best, best science fiction. And as a very recent example of, uh, of that, um, um, I urge you to check out uh, a wonderful short story by Ted Chiang, who's a uh, fantastic contemporary science fiction author called The Truth of Fact, The Truth of Feeling, uh, which describes a world which doesn't really seem to be that far away, where, where um, there, there are effective uh, digital memory prostheses. Um, Pretty much everybody uses life logging that, that sort of records continuous video and audio about everything that, that happens to us, uh, which, which is then sort of instantly indexed and accessible and searchable. And what, what that process does to human relationships when actually um, the way your, your memories have, written, have rewritten a particular argument that you had with your daughter is actually something completely different in, in reality. So, so I, I urge you to check that out as, a, as an example. So, um, finally, I, I think, uh, again, again uh, treating the same ground, ground as Yuri, um, but to, to put that in, in wider context, uh, science fiction does have a role of um, presenting kind of find, findings uh, from, from the future, so, so objects that are, that, are, that are so compelling that we actually want to have them. And, and, uh, and I think Star Trek Communicator is actually a very good example of that. So, um, so it, it definitely had a role in, in shaping the evolution of mobile communication devices. And uh, not only that, but even, even um, there's evidence that um, it subconsciously shaped the expectations of, uh, of the, the general public on how that technology should work. So I think Uri showed a picture of the early Motorola flip phone, and, um, um, which, which is, looks very similar to, to the um, uh, Star Trek communicator. But Motorola actually, before releasing that phone, tried a previous model that was very, very similar, except that it flipped uh, in a different direction. So, so the, the, it, the opposite way from the Star Trek communicator. And that was a complete failure. Nobody bought it. And uh, the second model they released was technically effectively identical, but it flipped out open the same way as, as Kirk's, uh, Kirk, Kirk's communicator. So. Um, Another, another recent, recent example of, of, more recent example of science fiction having a wider impact is probably William Gibson's novel, Neuromancer, uh, that uh, presents um, a, something he calls cyberspace, which we, which we now associate with uh, basically the virtual space of all interconnected computers in the world. And, and Gibson was the one who really was the first to, to properly explore uh, the implications of that idea. Um, and Neuromancer uh, sold about 160 million copies. Uh, and um, I think it's undeniable that, that it influenced uh, heavily the people working on the early development of the World Wide Web. And, and actually, it continues to have an impact on uh, the development of platforms like, uh, like Oculus Rift. Um, so the reason I have the word hieroglyph there is that <clears throat> uh, author Neil Stevenson has, has coined a term for these kinds of future artifacts that are so compelling that they actually pull us towards them. Um, so, so hieroglyph is, is sort of one of these things that everybody wants, and some, some, uh, which is um, some, something like cyberspace or, or, or the Star Trek communicator that, that is easily understandable and, uh, uh, and technologically compelling. And um, if, if we kind of think about the way how science and engineering disciplines work at the moment, uh, things are getting increasingly fragmented and specialized. And uh, it's actually very difficult to, to do proper multidisciplinary communication. So, so hieroglyphs can provide this way to, to have a shared common, common goal that, that everybody sees and, and, and can, can visualize and, and work towards. Um, and of course, one, one impact that that uh, uh, is having currently as well is that it's not only sort of um, the Manhattan Project that can realize a, a science fictional vision, but it's, but it's pretty much uh, everybody with, with the, the 
uh, sort of exploding maker culture. So people are building exoskeletons from uh, from the movie Elysium. So here, this guy's called the Hacker Smith, who has many many other uh, Hack Smith, who has many other uh, similar similar projects, uh, and uh, but, I mean, which do do really seem seem uh, uh, very good approximations of uh, what's going on. But but actually, uh, this hieroglyph, hieroglyph phenomenon has bigger impact than uh, just sort of toys that makers build. Um, one recent example that blew me away uh, relates to another uh, work by um, Stevenson. So he has a novel called The Diamond Age from, from the 90s that describes uh, a so society dominated by very advanced nanotechnology that, that sort of makes manufacturing of, of anything uh, extremely simple. But one of the concepts in the book is uh, a book called A Young Lady's Illustrated Primer. Which is, a, which is a book that teaches you to read it. So, so it's like a, it's a book with a very sophisticated artificial intelligence uh, teaching software built into it that, that sort of, uh, as, you, as you read it, tells you, tells you stories that gradually grow in complexity and, and basically one of the main characters, Nell, um, is completely educated by a young lady's illustrated primer or her, her copy of the book. And um, that idea um, uh, is, is, is very fascinating uh, in itself and it's actually uh, spurred the development of uh, the One Laptop Per Child project uh, at MIT. So, so the, the teaching software uh, on that, that device is, is heavily, heavily inspired by uh, Young Ladies Illustrated Primer, and it's actually called Nell. Um, and, and on the kind of impact that can potentially have, so um, one of the recent experiments that uh, the um, uh, OLPC project did was they um, installed uh, some of their teaching software on um, some Motorola Zoom tablets and dropped them outside uh, a remote village, uh, sort of in the boxes, uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, and a, a group of illiterate children picked, it up, picked them up and started playing with them. And um, so they'd never seen a tablet, they, they, they had no idea initially how to turn them on. Um, but uh, the MIT guys had tracking software that allowed them to, to see how the, the kids were using them. Uh, and in six months' time, uh, they hacked the Android operating system to allow them to use the laptop cameras. So, so the, uh, the MIT group had originally disabled the cameras on the tablets, and in six months, the kids got the cameras working, sort of from, from complete illiteracy, never seen a computer before, to, to hacking the operating system. So, so it's kind of hard to imagine a hieroglyph that is more compelling uh, and potentially with more, more impact. Um, just briefly to, to conclude uh, with some... Um, kind of per more personal experiences with this interaction of, uh, or, or the sort of virtual circle between, between science and science fiction. Uh, so um, I've, I've, I've kind of accidentally created one hieroglyph I, 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 that I can lay, lay claim to, uh, and which appears in my uh, first novel called The Quantum Thief. And um, it, it sort of came, by, uh, came about by accident. So The Quantum Thief is a detective story set in a far future uh, post-human solar system, and where, where uh, technologies like artificial intelligence and sort of ubiquitous sensing are, are completely commonplace. And um, I, wanted, I, I knew I wanted to tell a detective story set in the future. And the problem I immediately ended up having was that um, it made no sense. Because if um, in, in this kind of future, surely everything is going to be recorded digitally. Uh, all information about everything is going to be instantly available. So, so the job of a detective effectively becomes Googling. Uh, and that didn't seem like a very interesting conflict to, to build a, a narrative around. So, so I started wondering how I could get around that, and uh, I ended up um, in, inventing a society in the book called the Oubliette, um, a colony on Mars, uh, that is completely obsessed with privacy. Um, so I, I should say this was in 2009, so this, so this was a bit before the, the recent uh, Snowden revelations. But the, the, the Oubliette um, essentially values privacy higher than any other value they, they, they have. And um, the way um, sort of digital privacy is implemented in the Oubliette is, is through something called uh, Gevolot. So it's actually a Hebrew word uh, that, uh, that I liked. Um, so I wanted a word that mean, meant boundaries or borders, and, and uh, that seemed like an appropriate one. So what Gevolot is, is a set of privacy settings for, the, for reality. So uh, if you're a citizen of the Oubliette and you have a conversation, you automatically have to generate a privacy contract that specifies how much of that conversation are you allowed to remember, who can you share it with, uh, 
who did you have it with, uh, and, and so on. So, so everybody exists in this constant state of having, having to be aware of what the level of privacy in their interactions is. And uh, to, my, to my surprise and delight, uh, uh, Gevelot has actually become a term that, that uh, the, the communities that um, operate around uh, the emerging sort of wearable technologies are actually using for, for a privacy settings. So, so there's, uh, here's an example of uh, a uh, Japanese scientist um, for, uh, who, who developed uh, an anti-facial recognition visor. And uh, in the online thread on, 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 the, on, on sort of the news, news report in this article, the first comment was, oh, so this is like Gevelot for Google Glass. Uh, and uh, that, that sort of uh, um, made me feel good. But um, so, 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 so as, as Uri also said, um, science fiction does, does give us some vocabulary to talk about future technologies. Um, just very briefly, an, another, uh, another novel uh, of mine, The Fractal Prince, features, uh, features um, uh, viral books, uh, viral stories that uh, try to take over your brain. Um, so um, <laughs> brain, the brain consciousness and neuroscience were kind of on my, on my mind after, after having written that book. So, so I ended up getting together with um, my, uh, my friend Sam Halliday and we actually tried to, to create a book of the future that reads you. So, so a book that does actually directly interact with your, your brain. So, so, so we um, build a system where the reader uh, reads a story on, on the screen. Uh, they feel like they are reading a really linear short, short story, but in fact the direction of the story is shaped by, uh, by their brain activity measured through, through EEG. So, so that was kind of my own attempt at, uh, at prototyping a, a future, future object. Um, finally, to, to sort of uh, briefly mention uh, what, what, what um, how, how what I'm doing currently relates to science fiction. Um, the, the kind of science fiction um, hieroglyphs, I guess, that I grew up with relate very much to nanotechnology and, and building, building programmable machines at a, at a molecular scale. Um, there's actually also a connection to, to Yuri's story. Um, so it turns out that after the, the whole Manhattan Project story, Leo Szilard got very disillusioned with physics uh, and he became a molecular biologist. And, uh, and he was heavily involved uh, in the um, discoveries in the, in the late 50s and 60s that led to the understanding of um, the roles of um, DNA and RNA in, 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 in the creation of proteins inside cells and, and, uh, and how, the, how, the, how DNA encodes uh, information about proteins. So, so he kind of uh, did something, he, he's not, he, so he, he, he's probably one of the uh, only uh, scientists of, in the 20th century who was involved in both the sort of major revolutions that, that are still affecting our lives, lives today. Um, so, so I guess I'm, I'm in a more, much more modest way trying to make the same, same transition. I, my background is also originally in physics and I'm trying to get into biology. And um, uh, as Uri mentioned, I attended Singularity University and uh, our, our project there that led to, to my current company involved finding a new way to, to write DNA. So, so um, coming up with a system that could take sort of a DNA alphabet and join them together in a given order. And uh, we were looking for um, the first, um, we, we needed sort of a random set of data to encode in DNA, and uh, my co-founders ended up choosing the first two lines from my, my, my uh, first novel. So, so, those, so at least part of my books <laughs> do, do exist in, uh, in, in DNA. So, so that's, a, that's a project we're, we're continuing to, to develop and uh, to, towards this vision of uh, computing molecular scale machines. So, yes, just to conclude, uh, I think with the accelerating pace of technological change and the kinds of demonstrations we're seeing here at uh, DLD and uh, the technologies we're encountering in our, in our daily lives, uh, we, I, I feel we do need to, to deal with present-day reality in a, in a science fictional way. So, so we, need, we need some sort of um, medium uh, to, to kind of help us to absorb the shocks uh, of, of, of the future or, or, the, or the increasingly science fictional present. So, uh, and, and science fiction is kind of like a spacesuit that allows us to, to enter that uh, strange and, and hostile environment, and, uh, but also to can help us to inspire to build a better future. Thank you. Thank you. you know, as far as I know, um, Fiona was the, um, which is the tablet in uh, Neil Stevenson's book, the, the Diamond Age. 
as far as I know, that was the um, inspiration for uh, the, the, the Kindle. 